and recording. All right, I'll call this meeting to order. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes, Janelle. Here. Jacobs. Here. Piper. Here. Ryans. Here. Uh, this is the uh, Board of Zoning Appeal meeting. With the next, and I'm sorry, the Village Solicitor, Chris Conard, is also here. Right? I thought I was missing someone, but that's it. Um, has everybody looked at the minutes? I don't think there's a need to change the agenda. Um, I will have to recuse myself on the first application. So, um, Should I move the minutes? Yep. Do we need to do that? Yes. Uh, I move adoption of the minutes as, as presented in great detail. Really well done. Thank you. Second. I second it. All in favor say aye. 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 All in favor, so good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our first um, public hearing is application 15001. Uh, John, do you want to please? Oops. Wait. Yeah, that's. And I have to recuse myself for this particular application. So, Ellis, do you want to take over? So, what do you want to do? Oh, we're doing application 15001. Yep. All right. Uh, give me a second to actually find the Um, okay, typically we ask for the staff to present their sure. stuff to us. Uh, okay. This is a uh, various request for, um, for uh, the property at 120 Railroad Street, which is located in the village of Young Springs. Uh, the applicant is not present, but your client is Corey Byrne. Scanlon Construction is present in the audience tonight. Property is zoned B-1 Central Business. The applicant intends to renovate the property and use it as a residence. Uh, single family dwellings are committed to the B1 Go District. The project includes the installation of an eight foot tall masonry wall along the project, the property, excuse me. The applicant stated that the wall would be styled after similar street front, fronting walls found in London. Uh, that's London in the UK. I wasn't going to buy it. He's doing a report earlier. I was like, I've been right here in Dallas. I'm from here. Um, the section of the wall would be uh, blank space to host mural art. There's currently a chain link fence uh, along the front of the property and a uh, wood privacy fence along the fence and, uh, inside the rear of the property. And those are in conformance with the zoning code currently. Uh, the chain link fence is under four feet and the privacy fence is six feet. Uh, the raised request is looking for four feet of relief from the front yard fence height limit which is found in section 1260.01081 a of the zoning code. The property is not located along the street front edge. However, the, the address implies that the property does front railroad street. Um, if you look at the diagram, uh, not this diagram, it's the other diagram. This image here, um, you can see that there is a, uh, a access easement along the uh, east side of the property. And that would be considered the front edge according to the zoning code. Uh, this property is accessed by this easement uh, currently. And that is the village, the adjacent property is, a, is the village parking lot right there off the bike trail, on railroad street. Um, in evaluating variance, uh, Requests. There are criteria that are that are called out in Section 1278.04 of the Zoning Code. The board has the power to grant variances from the general provisions of the Zoning Code, including, by way of example, lot size, width, setbacks, parking requirements, and height. It shall be in harmony with the intent and purpose of the Zoning Code provided below. The standards from the terms of the code should be granted only when the applicant shows that strict application of the zoning requirement causes practical difficulties in the use of the property. The factors to be considered and weighed by the board in determining whether a property owner has encountered practical difficulties in the use of the property include that are not limited to these eight standards. One, whether the property in question will yield a reasonable turn, and whether or whether there can be any beneficial use of the property without the variance. 
whether the variance is substantial, whether the essential character of the neighborhood would be substantially altered, or whether adjoining properties would suffer a substantial detriment as a result of the variance. Uh, whether the variance would adversely affect the delivery of garments and services, such as water distribution, sanitary sewer collection, electric distribution, stormwater collection, or refuse collection. Whether the property owner purchased the property with denials of zoning restriction. Whether the property owner's predicament feasibly can be obviated through some other method than a variance. Whether the existing conditions of the variance is being sought or self created, and whether the spirit and intent behind the zoning requirements would be observed. Is substantially justice done be for by granting the variance. The board shall also determine after weighing the factors described above and any other factors the board deems relevant, whether the property owner has shown practical, practical difficulties so inequitable as to justify granting a variance to the property owner. Staff reviewed the situation in regards to the criteria that were outlined in the zoning code. Uh, staff asked the following eight questions in the staff report. Is there a beneficial use about the variance? Uh, yes, the variance can be constructed, the fence can be constructed to meet the higher parts of the zoning code. However, it will not achieve the degree of privacy desired by the applicant. Um, it is very substantial. Um, this is kind of a yes and no, but the um, variance would impact visual sight lines of the property from adjacent right away. However, if development were to occur on the village owned parking lot, uh, visibility of the property from the right away would be very limited. So in the future, the village were to develop a parking lot into a development compliance with the B1 zoning standard, uh, this would not be visible from the public right away. Uh, will granting the variance alter the central character of the neighborhood or will the joint property owner suffer substantial detriment as a result of the variance? Um, staff believes it will not. The property is adjacent to a village on a parking lot for the most part and also is in the rear of most uh, commercial establishments along Gate Street. Uh, the wall would provide a buffer from the activities of the parking lot. Would granting the variance interfere with delivery of government services? Uh, staff just believes it will not. It's not been, uh, there's nothing that has been identified that will interfere with delivery of services, the utilities of the property. Uh, did the proper property owner have now the zoning restrictions? Uh, they did not. The zoning, the property was not aware, the property owner was not aware of the restriction until the contractor had a discussion with village staff regarding the proposed improvements. Can some other method be used to address the issue besides the variance? Uh, staff believes that it, it cannot. If a conforming fence was constructed, it would not be enough to buffer the property from the adjacent parking lot. Uh, is the existing conditions for variance upgraded? No, the property owner did not create the conditions for the variance application. And would the granting the variance be in spirit and intent of the zoning code? Staff believes so. Granting the variance would allow for the flexible use of the prop, prop, of prop property, which is outlined in the intent section of the, of the beginning of the zoning code. Uh, as far as whether or not this application, uh, the strict application of the zoning requirement causes practical difficulties in the use of the property, uh, staff found that the front yard fence regulations do not adequately address screening issues for residential property for any public parking lot. The lot receives subsequent frequent activity, not only from cars, but also the location of dumpsters uh, for several businesses that front Dayton Street. Uh, they're also back there. The property would need adequate screening for such activities. Uh, has the property owner shown practical difficulties so inequitable as to justify granting variance? Uh, they have not. The applicant has not provided any evidence of undue financial hardship. However, the front yard fence regulations do not offer a degree of privacy desired by the applicants. Um, and looking at all of these things, uh, staff found the property is a unique situation being located in the interior of a block with only access by an easement on the adjacent parking lot property. The zoning code treats easements as street locations, however, the adjacent property is a parking lot, therefore the fence should be, could be treated as a the fence should be treated as buffering as a as being adjacent to a parking lot, uh, which would then mean means that it could be subject to regulations such as the buffer requirements. Uh, between parking lots that are already in code. Uh, zoning code does not allow that type of application for front yard fences. Therefore, the situation would require variance. Uh, looking at all of this, staff recommends that the Board of Zoning Appeals approve a variance for four feet of relief from the maximum fence height stated in section 1260.1A1 <coughs> of the zoning code. The conditions of the proposed wall include mural space for artists. Proposed wall will not exceed eight feet. 
and the proposed wall will be located three feet from the front yard lot line. And that the board also make the following findings of fact that there's a unique situation presented that is not adequately addressed by the zoning code. The variance request conforms to the intent of the zoning code, and the variance request is in compliance with the zoning standards, standards of section 1278.04 of the zoning code. Do you have any questions? I also have some pictures of the property on the back of the staff report. Thanks. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. Before we hear from the applicant, why don't we see if there are any sort of backgrounding or legal type questions that people want to ask of uh, John to clarify any of those matters? John, I just, uh, what would help me and what I, I didn't see in your report, which, by the way, is I think really clearly laid out and helpful in that sense. Uh, but the thing that, that I was looking for was uh, probably a little more information on the, uh, the actual requirement that would be asked to uh, oh, that variance. Too. So it would be sort of helpful to know the actual language of that and also something about the context that it appears in so we can get some idea of what the intent is. See, uh, the zoning code 1260.01 uh, buildings and structures um, as regulations for fences and walls. Number one states that the height shall not exceed four feet in the front yard, including both front yards, the corner lot or through lot, except within the clear vision triangle, which is the triangle that you need to have corners of streets in order to ensure that um, road traffic can see the, the other side of the street. Um, the other applicable one is that. Uh, that's that's the main one. So, so it's not over four feet in the front. In the front yard. And what about all the, zones? Okay. What about the other uh, uh, orientations? Uh, so, section f number four of that section says within a side or rear of the residential district, no fence or wall shall be permitted to exceed a height of six feet, um, and the rest of that does not apply. The only reason I'm calling this out is because residential zones are six feet, and it says in. Now, point number six, fences in non-residential districts shall be permitted to be up to eight feet in height, provided for each foot exceeding six feet, there shall be a one and a half foot, one and one and a half foot setback from the side property line. So uh, if, for example, the side yard fence does get up to eight feet, it would have to be set back three feet from the property line. And I apologize for not putting that language in here. No, that's okay. I just thought I'd, I'd mention just because for the future purposes, because at least for me, I don't necessarily have my book handy when I'm sitting with this material. Understandable. Okay. Other questions for John? Am I to understand the variance, the, the application, thank you, that the application um, is in relationship to the one, why don't I stop there in first state? That I, my understanding is that the, there will be a wall that surrounds the whole of the property. Is that is that right? Is that that's my understanding. understanding. Yes. Is the variance, and then my understanding is that the variance um, or the application is in relationship to to the one side of that wall. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. So this is central business. Yes. And the four feet in the front. That's. Does that apply to central business? It applies to all zones. All zones, okay, I got you, all zones. And then the the, the six foot side, that's just red? Just residential. Okay, the eight foot? Is non-residential zone. So educational, industrial, commercial zones. What about central? That would include central. Okay. So, so the, the sides, the eight foot, that's not they the eight foot. So, and the front you've determined is the front along the railroad street. That's correct. The easement. Is so that good, right? Yes. yes. So that would be four foot, is what you're saying, along the railroad street? It's required to be the maximum height of four feet right now. The variance would be for an additional four feet above that. So it's going to be eight foot across. Well, down eight feet across. across. Can I, I, and I missed part of that. So it's fine. Can you tell me what, uh, what's the purpose of the wall? Um, the wall is basically to shield because there's it's next to a, it's adjacent to a parking lot, so there's a lot of activity going on in the parking lot. So the applicant has requested that there be an eight foot masonry wall, and I'm sh I think that uh, the agent of the applicant would probably be able to address that a little bit better than I would be able to. 
Maybe that's, this, this might go to the discussion a little bit. But are, are there any precedents for any footprints? I don't, I'm not familiar with one in the village outside of the industrial. They had one earlier when, we, when I was on here. They, they, they attempted to raise their uh, privacy fence up to eight foot. And the village said that they didn't want to go start preference president, of, president of that. So they made them do it six foot. I don't know if they changed that or not. I remember we rejected one or two of them. Yeah. They were in residential zones. Okay. Yes, they were. That was. Yeah. And the only example I was thinking of was the solar, which is an industrial use in the education. But that's the, that's the question, I suppose, would be you know, the precedent or what sort of precedent mm -hmm. this would constitute. I'm not familiar with anything. Uh, I wouldn't even would be with this, the current zoning code. Judy, do you know if anything happened with the advice from September 2013 to present regarding any fence variances? No, I mean, nothing in, nothing in Central Business dis District, certainly. And I know that one that you're probably recalling, there was a conservation easement of some sort that factored into it as well. So I think each situation's been pretty unique. Okay. okay. Any more questions for John before we hear from the applicant? I, I do. The, and the variance is for the, um, the height, right? That, that is, it, it would be higher than what's uh, permitted by the code. Is that that's, right? That's correct. Is, is that it? Is there more to it than that? Because what I'm bringing up and what I'm looking at here is that look at the recommendation in particular. And it has seen here that the, uh, the condition would be that the wall be located three feet from the front yard of one of the that is basically say that it has to comply with the same regulations that the side yard would have. But that's not that that's not within the application of that, right? And that, that's not they're not applying for a variance in relationship to the setback, are they? It's only no. like the height of the, the, the wall. Only the height of the wall. Okay, that's very interesting. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions? Uh, Chris, we know your attendance and appreciate it. Uh, do you want to comment on this, or do you want to comment later, or do you want to not comment at all? You have, I you have choices here. I, I don't have any comment at this time. Okay, terrific. I mean, you've asked the right questions, and I think the staff report adequately addresses the, the issues and summarizes it quite well. I did, I did one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's your question. <laughs> so in here, it has a condition that, that the proposed condition would be that the staff has proposed is, is that there be. Um, this wall include a mural for, for artists. Are they, or is the applicant proposing to include that yeah. in the wall? Yes, okay. we've had discussions regarding uh, having incorporating some sort of local artistry into the, into the wall, and that's something that the applicant would be able to provide some information on. Okay, all right, very good, thank you. Okay, let's hear from the applicant, or the applicant's representative. Yeah, I think you probably should, and you need to start with your name and all the, the usual information. Does this work for for you? Yep. Uh, my name is Corey Grimm. I'm a scaling construction. Uh, we've been contracted by the Chappelle's that own this property um, to, we'll, we'll be doing the renovations and construction. Um, what they would like, because they are surrounded by a business district. Um, and I guess commercial, you referenced that exact code. We are permitted to have an eight foot high wall around all sides except for the front yard, and that was to be a four foot wall. Due to security and the visibility and, and the proximity to the commercial district, and John. Young indicated to me that there might be, you know, there is potential for the village wanting to put some more business development in the parking lot that's adjacent. With that close proximity, it, it's a security issue, especially for our, our client. He would like, the purpose of this variance is to raise that wall on the front yard side from four foot high to eight foot high to allow for more secure and more privacy. The wall, it, I, in the packet that I gave everybody, hopefully everybody has a copy if they don't let me know, 
it gives a general diagram. Uh, the first page is a general layout of what improvements to the property are proposed. Um, our client is interested in putting a sizable addition onto the home and adding a garage structure and a small studio man cave type <laughs> facility, for lack of a better term. Um, the other renderings that are in the packet show the, the layout of what is proposed. It almost, you know, it, it surrounds the entire property. But with the business districts, they do have three children um, that are not, one's elementary school, one's middle school, one is just entering high school. So they're younger children and they would like some security also. Um, the architect's renderings are showing their indication the majority of the wall, of the fence wall structure will be masonry to match the, to complement the house. It's an exi the home is existing, uh, it's from 1900s, it was built then. So they're trying to reflect back on that. The, if you'll move to page uh, 303, the architect is rendering the section of wall that he is showing at the top elevation is the section of wall that faces the dumpster area, the, the rear of the other, um, the stores. Gotcha. And what he's intending, what, what Mr. Chappelle is intending is to provide a facade on that side where local artists could put paint murals and so on. Um, he thinks that would be a, a, a positive thing for the community and it would also keep vandalism down. It would um, add something positive. There are a lot of murals around town. You would come pre-vandalized? Is that what you're saying? Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> well, the best way, we really, and I agree with him, the best way to prevent it is to have people buy into it. If it's their artwork, then a lot of people will say, well, I don't want you know to vandalize Ellis's drawing here. I want to. <laughs> so, well, they, you haven't seen my drawing. <laughs> well, it's almost better than what they got, what the architects have rendered here. So I'm pretty sure you would do all right. But anyway, he, he was trying to do that because he he understands that this is you know we're on, you know it feels like a fortress almost. They're trying to break it up and not have everything be masonry. Have some of it be like a wrought iron um, with some cedar, um, is some landscape material over the metal and things to block the view, but also lend some green to it so it's not so so rigid. And so, there. but um, they plan on having a, a gate for vehicles and a pedestrian gate also for access to the property. Where are they going to be? The access for the, the gates. Yeah. They'll be off Railroad Street. Off oh, all. Oh, okay. They're on the so front yard. The front yes. Is this, mm -hmm. this is the front row. Yes. If you okay. look at sheet four, you're looking at the front. Oh, I'm one page short. What would be along the top of this uh, fence? A masonry cap. Right, so we're not just about barbed wire. No, no, no. Glass. <laughs> it's going to be London style. Burning glass. glass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, I, where I was going with that earlier question, mm -hmm. so I the, the relationship to the mural, is yes. that my understanding from the renderings is that the, the mural would not be uh, on the wall that's that's at issue here, right? It no, be, it's not. Okay. It's not. So, well, we can talk amongst us, uh, but thank you for that. Grim. Any other questions for Ms. Grimm? You're not going anywhere, right? You're going to stay here? Yes, sir. All night. All night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I, I'm at my point because if we don't have questions now, but I'm ready to show you. Any other questions for Ms. Grimm? Okay, thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. One question I have is, I would like to see um, 
the outline of the central business district. So, I mean, if that's the rationale for doing this, I kind of want to know what our exposure here it is. Uh, excuse you know, me, I see somebody in the audience. Public yet? Pardon me? Are you going to have a public? Well, we, we can do that in a second. Let's just okay. see if, if uh, Mr. Donnell, do you have that handy? Are you able to address that particular issue? Yes, I am. John, unless you've got any fingers in the screen, we'll let Mr. Donnell tell us about that. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, please uh, come forward and identify yourself. I will do that. My name is Ted Donnell. I am the adjacent owner to the north of this property. Um, down Railroad Street. On Railroad Street. And I can address the Central Business District in that my property is within the Central Business District. So the north property line where the studio is on this particular application is within the Central Business District. The west boundary that is a little cut behind the studio, that little L there is not, that's on the Walnut side. Mm -hmm. Then the Central Business District runs straight all the way that includes that little parking lot that's Bob Baldwin's and Gulch's parking lot back there. That's the Central Business District. So the entire property is within the Central Business District except that one little northwest corner. And where, where the studio is? Where the studio is. So that got the map up on the screen here. The property question is Gotcha. And so I see your property going down Railroad Street is the next one, but then the property after that is now. Yes. So are you going to have uh, are you going to have stockade envy? No. <laughs> I can I can attest to the living on a parking lot issue. Um, I can address issues regarding security and the use of that lot. It is an after night use. Particular, it is heavily used on weekends. You can't, Railroad Street is completely parked on all the way around Railroad Street, up mm -hmm. Street on every single weekend day. I have to have barricades in the front of my lot, lot to keep people from blocking me in. Um, people use the little yard there to urinate, to throw the trash. Um, I see drug deals going on in that parking lot. It's, it is a highly active parking area. Um, the skate park, because of where it is and the kids that use the skate park use that lot a lot. Peaches after hours when it closes at every at 2 o'clock every evening the Peaches is open. There's activity in that parking lot. So I can tell you that, you know, if I will come to this board if I have to with a variance for any foot fence along my property line too because of the activity that goes on in this lot. It's, it's abnormal for any place else that I know of in the village. Not that I would move, I love where I live, but you know, it is, it's a really different condition. Um, the other part of the thing that I would say in support of this application is that Railroad Street is a complete lot older from the front of this property. It, you know, Railroad Street parallels the bike path. Right. You know, you have approximately 70 feet before you get to the property line of this particular property and quote the frontage. So, you know, the, the right of way is way over. This is just an access easement that, that kind of defines what is um, an island of a lot within this development. Um, the history of this lot is that this house was part of the original grain elevator that was there. So the development of this was the railroad fed the grain elevator. This house was actually open to the yard of the grain elevator and all the house structures that were a part of that. And so, you know, the old railroad is in fact now the bike path and railroad street both. And so this house was intentionally, I think, built back behind the grain elevator because it was wanting to keep it away from the railroad. So that's why it's uniquely um, situated in the village and I don't think that it applies to anything that is intended in the zoning code regarding setbacks and things like that because the frontage legally I don't even think exists <laughs> on that lot. It's very unique. So the 70 feet between the bike path and that yeah. property yeah. Wow. doesn't look like that. 
No, it's it's a whole width of a. I would have to get a scale, but I would say that's real close. How is that? How is the maybe this is a question for the applicant? Uh, how is the ingress, the driveway, going to be secure? It's an easement through a, a parked up area. It looks like to me. It's been, I just drove by it on my bike, but I don't have a great memory re recollection. Is it? I don't have a good answer for that. Um, Mr. Young indicated that Railroad Street was potentially going to be relocated. Is that? Yeah. Or could you explain that? It could be part of something in the future development, but there's no plan at this time to relocate Railroad Street. There's, there's no indication on our client's part to do anything um, outside of his perimeter of his, the area shown on the drawing. I also missed where the entrance was going to be. On the, uh, on the front rendering, if you see uh, the lot on the south end of the property, there is a, a gate and a driveway. So that's the, that's the garage right here, and right. that's the gate to enter. Oh, that's a gate. Oh, yeah. Facing railroads. Yeah, all right. On the, on the front page, it shows the driveway and pedestrian entrance and off of railroad street. I wonder if I could get um, I think that's what I for John rather than the applicant. But, but perhaps uh, between all of us uh, uh, some discussion or explanation of um, the status of the easement or easements actually. There are two of them at least adjoining this as far as I can tell. Uh, the one to the south looks like it's an operational alley in the area of the photograph. Um, and is that true? That it's, it's an effectively and it's a working alley? I mean, it, it looks like a corner lot if you consider both easements alleys, or if they're easements in the sense of undeveloped access, legal access only, then it's an interior plot. So I'm not sure. sure how to understand that. Look at the uh, this thing right here that does provide a 12 foot easement on the south side. However, the egress, egress easement is on the, uh, the west side. So the 12 foot easement is not pertaining to this property. It's not an access way for this property. I mean, it's probably an access way for properties on Dayton Street for them to access the rear of the property for. Yeah, but is it effectively an alley for Dayton Street properties? It's the fact it's this an alley that's not a public alley. It's just uh, an easement for them. Or is it owned separately? Do you know what is that? Uh, it's a separate plot, it looks like. I think it's a right of way. I can answer that. Can you you again? I, I have a lot of history with this lot. The, there is one owner of the access easement in the back, and that happened to be Bob Baldwin. Um, and so the alley is, in fact, an, a single owner, but there's, there's an, an agreement between all of the building owners along Davis Street that they can access that alley. So the Gulch accesses it, the Chinese restaurant accesses it, the AC service, um, and the residence. Um, the bike shop um, and then design sleeve. The design sleeve and AC service used it for their um, delivery storages, and the dumpsters are all located back here. What, what, what's so the, the form? What's out. the form of the agreement? Boy, if you had the writing of the hip bomb agreement, I would imagine that there is. Yeah. Um, there's also an issue regarding the stormwater that runs down that alley. It is a major stormwater collector, and the stormwater runs down that alley to a catch base and then goes down to the brine zone. Um, so it's, it's, I mean, it's a pretty industrial little alley, heavily used alley. But because it's an alley in nature, it's, you know, treated like a uh, yeah, public alley in the, in the rear area would be Side, it would be a rear yard or side yard alley. So it's that's the I, the way that the interpreted design code, the ingress, uh, uh, ingress, egress easement would be the front property access out of the front yard. So Let me just, uh, the way I recall our prior discussions about somebody coming and wanting to raise a fence was that uh, when we heard the cases presented, I remember I'm, I was sitting here thinking, I don't care, I'm, you know, I don't care how tall fences are. And then a member of our, of our, our uh, 
group here, who's not sitting here with us tonight, sensitized me to the fact that, in fact, if you start becoming a town with tall fences and high walls, it changes the character of the town. It really does. It's, an, it's a significant thing to do, uh, as opposed to what I was originally thinking, which is just a map. Uh, and I was won over by that argument. So, and, and, and so I believe that. Um, I mean, I can understand that there can be extenuating circumstances that would make it all right to have that. And so I'm interested in hearing those extenuating circumstances articulated, and then also, uh, and if they're uh, convincing, included in, uh, into this decision in such a way that makes sure that we're not setting a precedent for another property without all those extenuating circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so <laughs> the right. 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 extenuating circumstances, <laughs> yeah. you like the applicant to address this? Or would you like to address this? I can address it. Yeah, maybe you, you want to try it, Joe? There's a level of uniqueness to the situation. It is a residential property that's located in the business district. That's the first one. Uh, there's not many of that. The second one is that there's no formal uh, street frontage. And the third is that the adjoining property would be could be considered a detriment to the value or the usage of the property which is the, the, the village park lot. Uh, so we have three things that kind of are, are not a typical application of the zoning code. Typically, when you're an adjacent, when you're a property owner next to, adjacent to a parking lot, you're gonna, you have to provide, you can put a fence up, parking lot has to provide a buffer. Uh, there is somewhat of a buffer, not really, actually on the southeast corner, there's really no buffer at all. Uh, between the, the, the house and, uh, and the parking lot. So uh, this is something that doesn't occur very often in the village or in general. Would you have to provide an access for the fire department to get back there? Um, so if we're cutting it off at this fence. If you look at the site plan, the, so the, uh, the south side, the side property, is set back about 15 feet from where uh, it currently is. So, um, so there's 15 feet so in there. Side, if you think it's, uh, it's three feet. <coughs> so it would actually be three feet wider than it is now. <coughs> I, don't, I don't know what it is now. So and that, right now it's up to the property line. I have a picture here. So what's the, this, what's the distance? The width of the alley. With that, with the alley. Yeah. The width of this alley is approximately 29, about 30 feet. It's 30 feet? Over into Green County GIS, which is, okay. give or take, about a 30 feet off. I was back there, it didn't look like that. <laughs> Oh, well, you look at you see here on the, uh, the screen of the car. This is typically about eight, eight and a half feet wide right here. So you can probably get about three and almost four cars with in here. This part is a little bit narrower, but this actual part right here is a lot longer. And then so you're taking the, the fences at this property line right here and you're moving it back three feet. So you've got about thirty-three feet at that point. Okay. Just didn't look that way. Or is that a major? I don't know. To me, it's material. The other walls, as I understand it, are going to be eight feet high, right? Yes. Right along this, this wall. Mm -hmm. The variance is occurred. Um, but there's no variance for that, right? They can build. The other build. walls can be built to eight feet. That's correct. Um, I mean, to me, that's, that's material. I mean, I think it's the circumstances issue, but maybe the other issue we're bringing up. But that would apply that throughout the central businesses. Right. I mean, my concern is that when you show the map of the central businesses, can you throw that over here? I mean, they're actually, uh, you know, I mean, all on Corey Street, that's a bunch of this, there's a whole residential properties there. Uh, you know, there's some of the, uh, Residential properties, there's uh, 
So, you know, you, there are a lot, there's a fair number of residential properties in the central business district. And if we start having eight foot tall fences, it's something like the central business district would have having, you know, as a matter of course, we got to give them town. So uh, that's why we need to be we need to very be very clear <coughs> what's specific about this property that uh, would would allow it to uh, to have such a fence. Well, I mean, in your regulation, how many? Residential properties have a parking lot in their front yard. Not just on street parking, but like natural parking lot. Folks, the library has a parking lot. Oh. The children's center has a parking lot. I understand your concern about replicability, and that's very central to how I administer zoning code. Yeah. So uh, I hear you on that. Uh, I, in my looking at the rest of the business district, uh, cannot think of any residential properties that are, have that are landlocked that have a parking lot in front of them. But I'm new here, so if you guys know. <laughs> <laughs> I would question the frontage. Pardon me? I would question where the frontage is on this property. Yeah. Because it because of the fact that it's not on a right of way. You know, it's it's the the frontage could be the alley to the west, could be the alley to the south, could be the, the parking lot to the east. Okay. Well, you know, but the, does that change the the argument or the, the discussion? I think that it, you know, it, from my perspective, it adds to the peculiar nature of this particular property that doesn't set a precedent for allowing an eight-foot privacy fence. In quote a front yard. The zoning code defines a front lot line. You term it as in the case of an interior lot, a line separating the lot from the street right away or road easement. That's where I got that. Definition to ask the same question. Then the road easement would actually be on the Because, because there is this no is way an egress easement, egress, uh, egress easement, not a road easement. Well, where would the road called the railroad street, where would that easement get to the frontage of that property? If you drive down railroad street, how do you get to the front of this property without going through another property? You can't. So, the, so Dayton Street is the road access easement to the southeast corner of this property. Which could make the alley the front yard. Well, I don't so know if it's not relevancy, but well, how do you get it? How do you how do you get to this property at this point? Where is the ingress and ingress? Is it, is it where this off of this street? Is it where the gate would be, or is it uh, on that side, or is it on a different side? Okay, street down. All right. So as as is. <coughs> And that doesn't change. Well, the, here, I think that if we're trying to uh, make a case for what makes this particular product property um, a consideration for an eight foot privacy fence, if we were to call this line the frontage and having this as dumpsters and the back of a whole line of businesses, I think is a real good indication that there's not going to be a precedent set for allowing that eight foot fence in quote the front yard if it's that out. That's how I would present the outcome. So this is clarify <laughs> this is kind of like a I would guess a flag lot where you would treat the egress easement as a driveway. The furniture would actually be on Dayton Street, which would then say that the front yard is defined by the, whatever the setback is. In B1, the setback is zero. So that means any, that means any point past zero on the front edge, you can have any foot pass. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. no, Not to me. No, no, sorry, I don't say, you say, yeah. <laughs> well, the architects don't understand. But, uh, <laughs> what he's saying is that Dayton Street should be the front edge. The ingress is. Uh, egress egress easement considered as like a driveway an access driveway 
the property. So the front yard is actually that is on it's along Dayton Street. And since all you need to do to need is the front yard setback to put up a side yard fence, then you could put the, the side yard height <coughs> fence behind that front yard setback, which you would obviously need because it's set so far back. Uh, I'd say it's about over 100 feet from Dayton Street that it would conform to the zoning code. So you're saying there's no front? There's no front? Uh, let me use the map. Yeah. This is the front, yeah, this is the front. And yeah. because the zoning code says there's a zero, there's a zero uh, front yard setback, or 10, I think one to 10. Um, so 10 feet from this front line, is the front yard right here, regardless of whether or not these are owned by other properties. And then everything behind is considered a rear and side yard, even though it's other properties and easements and so forth. So I pretend that this is a stub of property that just is a driveway, and that this is not the front. That's, that's what he's saying. I still don't understand. It's okay to have a fence along the uh, uh, alley. I mean, is that the way the code reads? Or? John, I just uh, Yeah, I guess this, the question would be is the alley, your, your interpretation is Dayton Street is the front, but I'm, I, my question would be why isn't the alley the front? Even though it's an alley, but some agreement that we don't have the front of us. It is not a public alley, it's an easement for the adjacent property owners, so it's not really uh, a dedicated, uh, it's not a public street or a public alley. And alleys by nature are service streets that are typically found in the interior blocks. Uh, so they're typically not considered frontages historically by definition. I think the, the crux of this argument kind of comes down to the definition for, for the, lot, front lot, the front lot line, which you know, says street right away or road easement. If the board makes a determination that this is not a road easement, then this property technically has no frontage. It's bad. Does that create other problems? You would have to further define what you would think of would constitute a road frontage. Would it be a, uh, a road easement, excuse me. Would a road easement be where a road is intended to go as part of development? Uh, would it be any it, this egress, uh, egress easement, or would it be any easement? But you have your original determination, I guess, is that the easement to the east is one that the property owner can rely upon since it's it's um, it's public easement or it's publicly recorded in such a way that they have it's, rights to it. It's recorded easement; they have rights. They, to they, they don't have rights to the one to the south. Essentially, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. And. It has a railroad street address, front railroad street, historic buildings, front entrance is there, and you have an egress egress. Easement. So how can you say Dayton Street is uh, front? What uh, it actually fronts an address on railroad street. What Mr. McDonnell was articulating was that the road easement would be considered the road act where the where the easement accesses the road. Which, because the easement does not access Railroad Street, it access Dayton Street, then Dayton Street should be considered frontage, according to this argument. Even if the address says Railroad Street? That's correct. John, can I, just for clarification, if you determine that the, that the frontage is to Dayton Street, is a variance required? No. And why is that? Explain that. Because it would be ten, set ten feet away from the uh, the, property, the, uh, the street, be further than ten feet away from the street, and thereby <coughs> there are right the play through. Just so I can see all Because it is it would be about <coughs> one hundred and three feet away from Dayton Street. Okay, so now which means that it would be, you know, it would be beyond a, the front yard setback requirement for the B1 zone. So then it can't be, it's not, 
of a front yard. Then it would be a front yard. And yeah. four foot attaches. Read, do, you, do you mind reading again the, the four foot requirement, how yeah. that's situated there? Notwithstanding other provisions of the zoning code, fences, walls, and floors are permitted to require yards under the following conditions. One, the height shall not exceed four feet in the front yard, including both front yards, or corner, or through lot, except within a clear vision triangle, which shall be three feet. Does every property have a front yard? Not this one. <laughs> well, I mean, by definition, do we have to? I mean, you know. <laughs> I think we've been through this before, haven't yeah. we? Some properties have two front yards, but they find that they have zero. Zero. Right. Okay. The front yard is defined as the space extending the full width of the lot between the nearest edge of the building and the front lot line. What's the code section? 1284.11 definitions XYZ. <laughs> and the I mean, lot front lot line? The front yeah. lot line, which I read to you earlier, see the exciting. Uh, it says in the in the case of an interior lot, the line, the line separating the lot from the street right away or road easement through and corner lots shall have two front lot lines. So it comes back to road easements. The uh, front yard is, is, is relying on the front lot line. The front lot line says uh, street right away or road easement. But isn't the front lot line, whether it's a front lot line along the alley or along railroad street, it's going to be a front lot line, isn't it? I mean, isn't one of them going to be a yeah, front, front, line? front lot line? Okay, and then isn't the four foot requirement going to apply there, regardless of how far away from the street? At some point, if, if it exceeds the front yard setback, after it exceeds the front yard setback, it becomes part of the side yard. So, for example, if you had uh, a lot, let's say it was a 30 by 100 lot uh, in the central business district, and you decided to build uh, a house 60 feet back, after the first 10 feet, you could technically build a, an 8 foot tall privacy fence. I'll give you an example of a fence within the central business district that's 8 foot high is they have has a fence on the front yard. It just happened to be right on. Right. I'm sorry, say that again. Where is this? The cavern. Okay. Right. You know, if, if thinking about the zoning in terms of why, it, why certain things apply to certain business districts, that's an example of why the you know, liquor license start to apply or noise between a restaurant and the senior center might be something that could apply, but that's why you allow fences within a central business district for privacy and security. Yeah. That are different from other zones within the. I got that. And when I look at this particular property, I'm familiar with the area. You know, I, I walked that alley and walked down the street. It's a, it is a unique property. I mean, and a uniquely exposed property and kind of a uniquely. Uh, um, We'll just leave it as exposed property, uh, and so I can. I mean, I can understand. I mean, I my, my inclination is to say, yeah, okay, I get it. But we need to be able to articulate the rationale in a way so that it doesn't become a a, a tool for uh, a football to go all over throughout the central business district. That's what I'm saying. Well, unless you if acknowledge that. Deaton Street is the front edge, in which case you set no precedent whatsoever. I just have to make How do you do that when it's, when it's fronting on Railroad Street? Well, it's not necessarily fronting on Railroad Street. Uh -huh. Of course it is. Railroad Street is right by the front of it. It's got a property between Railroad Street and the front of that, that fence line. There's a separate property between that, just like there is on Deaton Street. Well, so, then, exactly. so then, what, if Johnny, if your argument is that if you're set back from the thing a certain distance, then it's no longer a front lot line, then wouldn't it apply to Railroad Street too? Given where this is situated, 
It could, yeah. But yeah. I just don't see that argument. And I don't know, Chris, if you can help us with that, but I'm not seeing it. In my mind, something's going to be a front lot line, and something's going to be have the four foot requirement. <laughs> I think what this comes down to is that this really is a very peculiar lot that the zoning code does not clearly address. Um, I, you know, in my experience, I'm not comfortable making the interpretation that, uh, as, as you said, that the, the, the loss in front should be considered the setbacks. Um, my, my comfortableness comes with defining the easement as the front edge, because I want something to have a front yard. Uh, the board can say, no, that's, that's wrong, we, we don't believe there is a front edge, or they can say that we agree with you, or we can say something else. Um, that's partly what, that's mostly why this is before you guys today. I guess the question I have too, um, you're, you're making a distinction Joe, between a, two types of easements, and I think both of you are calling it a road easement, but uh, I, I guess I've seen this, this happen in the planning and council where uh, a number of easements have been vacated. I, I don't think this easement can be vacated and still have a usable lot, maybe. So that would seem to put it into the category of being a road easement. It's not, what, what's being vacated by council are abandoned alleys or right. streets that are publicly owned. That have been plotted, yeah. to, uh, plotted, excuse me, but yes. that's not used. This is an easement that is on private property. Right. That just has to be owned by the village. But, I mean, is, this, is this technically a buildable lot if it doesn't have a connection to a public street? some permanent legal way. No. You need to have access. Okay. <laughs> you need the eyes. <laughs> you've, you've raised a number of interesting questions. Um, it, it seems to me, within the context of what the recommendations are, the uniqueness of the, the property, I think that John's analysis of the report is pretty well thought out. Um, dealing with a policy issue of the approach with other stockade type structures. Um, as a policy, certainly that's a valid discussion, but I think you also have to go back and look at this unique property and is, a, is there a basis to deny or do you need to grant it based upon the uniqueness of this property and the use that is currently Residence, as a residence. Um, and I'd have to really sit down and dissect the code outside of this meeting to, to weigh in on, on what John and, and Mr. Donnell have been discussing. So I, I'm not prepared to, to give a full answer on that one because that, that's, this discussion has gone to a place where I, I did not anticipate going. Thanks. Uh, I'm glad to know that I'm not the only one who's the legal piece of this. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting yeah, discussion. Yeah. I mean, the, the reality is, is that I just don't think, you know, you're going to see a whole lot of community. I mean, this, this residence is in an island. Yes. And, it, you know, you, you start to look at it all and you say, okay, well, how do I get to it? Through a private easement over a publicly owned piece of property. I mean, it's just a bizarre set of circumstances that I don't know if there's any other places within the village that this, that this would exist. Maybe, you know, maybe. Well, I think that's personally why, what I was trying to lay out, you're trying to find justification for granting a variance and not making it a precedent within a district. And I think that the, the uniqueness of that, because of all the legal constraints about what is right of way, what is the legal right of way, we still don't have railroad street as a legal right of way. You know, very frustrating to live on railroad street not have a legal street because it doesn't show up on GIS and you know, GPS and things like that. <laughs> and people can't find my place. But, you know, those are issues that, that, you know, the village has to deal with. And we talk about village station. You know, I go to village station. And when we planned village station, we, had, um, we were going to locate, relocate railroad <coughs> to the other side where this access easement is and literally create a street that was called Railroad Street. You know, now that that cleaned up all of that 
oversight and all those easements and all those access things and things like that. But when the village owns that property and there are no plans to develop it, it is a private piece of property, no different than red, no different than the property on Bay Street or anything else. And that's why I think it's unique and justifies the variance. So do we have any do we have other properties that are located on the interior of a block with the only access via an easement and adjacent to a parking lot? Access via an easement? How do well, you Railroad access? Street is. What is uh, Railroad Street was built by default as access along the railroad to get to the grain elevator. Right. And the house, my house, was built on the railroad. And there was, you know, but they used the, the right of way of Railroad Street is this one. The park district owns the right of way for the bypass. That's the old railroad street, the old railroad right of way. Railroad street is within that right of way, therefore it's not dedicated as a separate street from the railroad. So it's just a legal, a legal thing. I think it could be bought and done that way, but the village would have to run for a lot of people to do it. Okay, um, more discussion, we've spent a fair amount of time. Uh, just if you could humor me and just kind of open a public hearing there and then <laughs> if you need to just for form, form's sake. Okay, great. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, so at this point, we'll uh, open the public hearing and invite any members of the public that would like to address this issue to do so. I have nothing to say. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, your comments, I suppose, should be recognized as being part of the public hearing. Yes. Uniformly open, uniformly open the public hearing. Pardon me? Okay. Yeah. We 
Just do it all over again. Yeah. Do I need to repeat it all? Okay, if nobody else wants to speak, we'll close the public hearing. Any further discussion among the board members? Okay, so then, our, as is our tradition, we go through the various criteria, and each person votes on each one, and then we ask the final question uh, about practical difficulties, right? And Chris, is there any, is there new thinking on how to do this? This is what we've been counseled to do in the past. This is my first BZA meeting of solicitor. Oh, that's well, so when we redid the, the, uh, the contract and the fee agreement. We said that we would come to certain meetings that might require legal guidance. <laughs> I'm learning your procedures as well. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I know that we're always open for input on the procedures if you see something. Okay, um, so let me just make sure that I'm reading through. Okay, uh, so here we, here we go. I'll, I'll read it and then we'll just march down the line here. Uh, and Judy, you'll do the roll call on each one. Or do you want to read each one? Ooh, uh, that's, Ooh, that's I'll good. Do you want to get <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, dude. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll read it. Okay, so well, start keeping score. And I, and I'm not calling roll until the final question. So this is just a, I'll take it as you verbally, yes or no. Okay, all right. Other. So the first criteria is whether the property in question will yield a reasonable return or whether there can be any beneficial use of the property without the variance. And we'll start with you, Dan. Uh, yes. 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 Okay. Uh, whether the variance is substantial. Just trying to figure if that's sure clear to me or not. <laughs> I think yes. Okay. Uh, I'll say no. No. And no. Okay. Whether the essential character of the neighborhood would be substantially altered or whether adjoining properties would suffer substantial detriment as a result of the variance. We're talking essentially about this east line only. Yes. I'll say no. Uh, no. 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 Okay. Whether the variance could adversely affect the delivery of governmental services such as water, sanitary, electric, stormwater, or refuse. Yeah. No. 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 Okay. Whether the property owner purchased the property with knowledge of the zoning restrictions. Yeah. Yes. See, I say yes, uh, and uh, because he had constructive. I would like to have a thing about this, right? right. Because the, the village, the staff, the staff's opinion, right, as I understand it, is that this property owner did not, yeah. which, which implies that there is no constructive knowledge. But to my you know, that my understanding would differ with that, right? That, that the constructive knowledge would apply here. Right? I don't know if the solicitor would like to weigh in on that. I guess, I mean, we've had this issue before, and I'd just like to have a, if at all possible, I'd just like to have an opinion on this. So, you know, if you can, you know, going forward, the answer is if, the, if the, the, code, the zoning code was in effect, there would be constructive knowledge as a public document. I mean, the real issue probably comes up in the context of would a property owner envision something when they first bought the property? They may live in the property for a while and decide I'd like to do something, um, but there still would be constructive It is a sort of right. uh, Did you get a chance to enforce your opinion on this stuff? No, I'm, I, I, I still have my question, but that's okay. Let's uh, well, are you a yay or a nay on the uh, knowledge? Whether the property owner purchased the property with knowledge of this other restriction? I don't think he did. Okay, no, yeah. Chris? Yes. And then uh, we're, well, we're just sneaking up on here. Six, whether the property owner's predicament feasibly can be obviated through some method other than a variance. Yeah. We haven't really discussed with but I'm going to say yes. Um, I'm going to say no. No. Yes. Okay. Whether the existing conditions for which a variance is being sought were self-created. Yeah. I'm not sure what that 
in this context, right? Yeah. Chris, could you help us with defining how the word would answer that question? Yes, I think that was there something that the property owner did uh, in the context of owning the property that would have created the need for this? I don't know. I mean, the, you know, the, I can't tell you, you may be able to think of an example, but I, I can't think of off the top of my head. But what I see is this property existed, somebody bought it, they're looking to create some barriers to the, what's there and some privacy. That the property owner didn't create any of that dynamic. That was all pre existing and would exist for anybody who owned that property. So it would, would, answering yes would entail some sort of major modification, or subdivision, or change of use, or something like that. I, you know, I, 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 well, let, let's say that, that a property owner did something like wanted to put a pond in, and they dug a pond, and then they wanted to build a, 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 a an eight foot privacy fence. Well, they would the property owner then would have created that condition. That's kind of how I interpret it. Okay. I'll, I'll say no. 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 Okay. Whether the spirit and intent behind the zoning requirements would be observed, and substantial justice done by granting the variance. This is sort of the spirit and intent question. Dan. No. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, and so then the final question is we need to determine after weighing the factors described above and any other factors that the board deems relevant, whether the property owner has shown practical difficulties so inequitable as to justify granting a variance to the property owner. So this is really the vote on whether or not to grant a variance. Uh, you have to have a motion. Yeah, I was just going to say that, but okay. um, I think it's so. And so uh, is there a motion? To grant this variance. Yes. Yes. Is there a second? I'll second. second it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any further discussion? Okay. All right. So your motion is to grant a four foot variance to the height. That's um, uh, height. In section 12. Uh, on the eastern side along the road. Yeah. On the eastern side of the road street. That's okay. And then, and would the, does the motion include the, uh, the articulated conditions? I would just say, I would, I would have scratched the mural space because it doesn't apply to the side of the property. It's actually on the other side. Mm. I, I kind of like it in another person. Um, and I, I would also want a condition that just at the, the top of the wall be, I don't even know how you articulate it. And I know there's no plan to put but I don't want anything to be looking at that. Uh, so no barbed or no sharp pointed wire, nothing. <laughs> I would say nothing exceeds the height of a foot. Because you could put um, a little wrought iron detail on it that's got spikes to keep people from going over it. That would be very decorative, you know. But I think if you just say he put back in the of masonry, then nothing goes in the other than can I ask a, maybe this would be a procedurally irregular, we're coming up to drawing some conclusions on this. Um, can, I, can I say that the reservation I would have with what's been proposed is uh, revolves around the idea, or the question of is an eight foot fence the only way to achieve the desired results of this property? Um, and I'm not entirely convinced about that, but I, I gather from the discussion uh, that, and, and also from discussions in this group in general that we try to find ways to accommodate people's wishes if possible without uh, creating undue consequences to others that might be enjoying So I mean, I, I appreciate the spirit of that. I, I wonder if there's any way to, to sort of improve the, the sort of, or, or to, to lighten the touch while achieving what the owner wishes to do. And something that caught my attention uh, when John, you were reading the code, there was a provision about the six foot fence being standard and then beyond that going up to eight foot, there's additional setback for each foot uh, above six. I, I, I think in a sense, 
the same logic could be applied to uh, any variance of offense. Every foot that you go above the standard, you would give back something in terms of the setback, 4.5 feet. So if they're looking for a full foot variance, um, would it be four times 1.5 feet? Would that be a reasonable thing to ask as far as the setback? I disagree with that. Well, you're getting very, very fraught here because you've got a motion on the floor, then you've got an attempted amendment to the motion, and now you have an entirely different argument in terms yeah, of the so perhaps. Let me see if I can clean this up. Thank Go you. ahead. Do you want to? I was going to suggest, I would, I would just like, uh, when, I, when I took a look at Chris's recommendations, he's actually done a good thing here with conditions and findings of facts. So if the maker of the motion would be, be willing to withdraw his motion right now, and what I, what I would like to do, what I would do then, is walk us through the findings of fact, which I would uh, 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 amend a little bit. Uh, we would maybe agree on those, then we would agree on the conditions, then we would, uh, uh, then, or then we would, go, then we would entertain a motion for the overall thing. But it would require the maker of the motion to withdraw that motion. I don't think I'm going to withdraw or not. Um, yes, I withdraw the motion. And, uh, we're going to assume that that's the way to do it under Robert's rules of order. Uh, so let, let me suggest that here's what we do. If you look at Chris's uh, memo, he says, and the following findings of fact. I would like us to uh, yeah. specifically <laughs> make. Chris, like a John, John, John gets right <laughs> <up there. laughs> Chris, excuse me. We've got two Chris's. Only one John. I, I reckon. Uh, uh, John's. Uh, Memo has these findings of fact. I would, I would, I would like us to specifically make these findings a fact. Uh, but the first one would be amended to say there's a unique situation presented that is not adequately addressed by the zoning code. This includes, and then you would go up to the very first line of John's or discussion above uh, that the property is located on the interior of a block with block with the only access being an easement on an adjacent parking lot property. Okay? You see that? So you would you would insert that there as the finding effect at the end of, of that first line. Okay? So are, are people comfortable with that as a finding effect? And the idea here is to sort of that way would be included in the record of this case. And so in reflection, if this comes up again, this would sort of be attached to it. People would see the findings of Okay, they zero facts. So facts differ. It, it's not. It doesn't have presidential. Power. So we, we can be clear on the record in the minutes that will be made. Where are you suggesting is that inserted up? Is a new number one in consideration of the zoning criteria as a finding? Um, no, no, it's not a criteria. It's a finding of fact that would simply be adopted by this body okay. and would be uh, reflected in the minutes. And in any documentation that we prepare. Okay. Okay. And so it would read the first one is that there is a unique situation presented that is not adequately addressed by the zoning code, in that the property is in a unique situation being located on the interior of a block with only access via an easement on the adjacent parking lot property. So that's what the, the uh, actually, that's the only finding. So I would I would propose that as a finding of fact if folks are comfortable. I, if somebody wants to move that as a finding of fact, then we can take a vote on that. But we include that. Would the motion be whatever the motion is plus that finding of fact? Yes, exactly. That's the idea. But I first want to make sure that we're in agreement on this finding of fact. That's what I'm saying. There's no way you can tell what it's going to become. 
we have, we have some preliminary plans to consider converting that area into the space where we can have uh, events. Typically, uh, we've had some issues with, uh, I guess, desire to move some street events off the street into a place that we can have electric supply to to the event coordinators and so forth. And the railroad models identify as that. So until the time as to which it could be uh, developed in the future, we look at possibly for the next few years maybe using that as a spot for for uh, street events. So there is a desire very preliminary at this stage on possibly utilizing that parking lot for that space. I think procedurally, if a motion is now made that includes the finding of fact, in the second that you can slide into your okay. So you're suggesting that we have, that if someone wanted to make a motion that included that finding of fact, along with, say, to approve this, and the conditions, then we could have one vote, and that would take care of everything. Is that what you're going to do? Yes. Okay, so I'll just put that out there to see if anybody wants to make that motion. So the motion has a finding of fact, conditions, three conditions that Chris has, that John has, uh, and a motion to approve. And then we vote yes or no. That we're not saying we approve, we just need a motion. Can I make a suggestion? Yes. That you say something of this nature. Given the unique that the, this unique situation presented for 120 Railroad Street uh, is not adequately addressed by the zoning code, in that the property is a unique situation being located on the interior of block with only access by an easement on the adjacent parking parking lot property, I move that we approve the requested variance of four feet. To the John Huffy. To the four foot variance. Yeah. For, for the, to the four foot fence requirement for the front yard. With the following conditions. With the following conditions. Yeah. conditions. Yeah. Yeah. So we're waiting up for a motion for that. I don't know if it's proper for the chair. And I'm sorry, did you include the mural space for artists, yes or no? You took that away, and then I heard an argument to move it in. And you can leave an animal some, somewhere on the fence. It's, I mean, it doesn't apply to the front yard fence, but it will okay. be inside the yard fence. Yeah. Is there such a motion? Okay. Is there a different motion? Someone may make a different motion. No, I'll move. I'll move forward. Do I need to go forward? Well, that's why I said it. So you could say, I move what she said, and we can proceed. I, I move for what she said. <laughs> that's what she said. And I, I don't think that's part of the, uh, is why she makes a big focus. What she said, the three conditions are that uh, a wall include proposed mural space for, uh, include mural space for artists, not exceed eight feet, and look at three feet from the front yard. And did you want to add that the Proposed uh, that the masonry um, had a suggestion that it be uh, will not exceed eight feet in height. And so I think that it's masonry, I think that's so probably just have adequate, just like that. Okay. Just say that as no spiky things. Okay. Okay. So that's that's your motion, Chris. That's my motion. Okay. Do we have a second? simply says we'll move this board and get to vote on it in a minute. I mean, it does not imply agreement. Okay, then I'll second it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. All right. Um, 
Let's, uh, let's move forward to a vote. Your turn. Oh, your turn. Right, here we go. Pfeiffer. Yes. Perry. Yes. Reyes. No. Jacobs. Yes. Zone. Uh, is there any requirements by 
which is 4,800 feet. Lot B is uh, an interior lot with a width of 45.5 feet, which is uh, which meets the minimum require, lot width requirement of 40 feet, and is also 6,944 square feet, so it is also a conforming lot. Lot C is a landlocked parcel that's not located along the frontage. It does meet the width and area requirements, but is not considered a noble lot. Do not have any access to dedicated public right away without these lots. The variance criteria is similar to what we reviewed before. Do you guys want me to review that again? Or no one can find it. Uh, in considering the zoning criteria, we, I ask if there are beneficial use for other variants. Uh, staff believes that there is and is not. As the property is currently configured, there is little beneficial use. However, all separate lots do conform to the zoning code and are billable lots in their own right, with the exception of lot C, which lacks street access. If the property is replanted, the request for variance would not be needed. Two, is the variance substantial? Uh, no. It was Require a would eliminate the need for variance and allow for more flexibility and setback to the construction of the house. Uh, I mean, it could be substantial actually, looking over this again, because it would it is the maximum setback. Uh, they're asking for the maximum amount of setback for two lots. Uh, will granting the variance alter the essential character of the neighborhood, or will adjoining properties suffer a substantial detriment as a result of the variance? Uh, staff believes they will not. Corner lot, lot, the house is uh, in disrepair uh, and would, would be demolished or replaced with a new house. Uh, does granting the variance interfere with delivery of government services? Uh, it does not. The house would utilize existing fully tapins. Uh, does the property owner have knowledge of the zoning restrictions? Yes. The property owner purchased the property with knowledge of the interior lot line and decided instead of replacing, they wanted to do a variance. Uh, can some other method be used to address the issues of the variance? Yes, they can get replanted. Is the existing condition for the variance not created? No, however, the applicant has the opportunity to address the situation and fix it in a way that would not require variance for, for the new house or any other structures that would be built on the property in the future. Would granting the variance be in the spirit of the zoning code? The staff believes that it will not be. Granting this variance would go against section 1240.02c, which states that the code was developed to promote efficient use of land. Granting the variance would not allow the three parcels to be used efficiently in order to replanting the property. Does the strict application of the zoning requirement cause practical difficulties in the use of the property? Uh, no, the applicant is constructing a new house on the site, which is considerable investment. The financial burden of condu conducting a replant would be minimal in the scope of the project. As the property owner has shown practical difficulties so inequitable to ju as to justify granting the variance, no. The yeah, applicant has not provided any evidence of the new hardship to its application. At the time of the application, staff indicated that it would be better an option for the applicant to replant. The replant would eliminate the need for any future variances regarding structures located on or near the interior lot line. It would eliminate the need for this variance. Additionally, there is concern regarding the strict interpretation of the building code. And uh, I've reached out to Mr. Alcuzma from Green County, but I've We've been playing voting tag, so I can't. I don't have the official interpretation on this, but as a former building inspector, I can tell you that lot lines are treated as building walls in the building code. Therefore, any building wall within three feet of a lot line must be fire rated for at least two hour protection and fire. This requirement could potentially drive up costs of construction, which would be far more than going through the replant process. Staff is concerned that granting the variance will not address any future interior lot line problems for future additions or accessory structures since the variance request is only for the new principal structure at the site. So, for example, if you were to build a shed or a garage and it would straddle the existing lot line, you would have to come back before the board for the variance. The code is written to imply that variance request is one of last resort, the situation is unique, and there's uh, substantial evidence that there's a practical application of the zoning code. The zoning code would not work in the presented situation. There is a more logical, legal, and non cost prohibitive option for replant, which the applicant has not done. The option is not cost prohibitive given the size and scope of the project. Properties are not unique for the purposes of constructing the house, and the applicant has not presented any evidence of the hardship. Staff has found that this is not a case where a variance would be appropriate. Therefore, staff recommends that the Board of Zoning Appeals deny the variance for a five foot of relief in each of the interior lot lines uh, as regulated in Table 12. This should be 1268.03a of the zoning code. 
with the following findings that the applicant has not exhausted other methods to correct the need for variance. They have not demonstrated the inequitable circumstances. They have not demonstrated uh, any type of uh, practical difficulties, not, not hardship. Uh, and granted, variance is not spared the intent of the zoning code. Do you have any questions? And I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody have any questions for John or Chris or anyone else? I want to add one thing to what John said in his report. Under 1260.04G, uh, uh, um, it says uses on a lot. Every building structure or use or established within the village shall be located on a legally recorded lot or parcel and shall conform to all requirements of this code. I think that makes it pretty clear in my mind. Um, you know, I have a question uh, regarding a replat option for this applicant. If he replats it and makes the three lots into a single lot, um, how would we interpret that what would be an island lot C, and how does that work into the side yard and rear yard setbacks? I think I have a picture. I don't think it's in my files that I brought with me, but there's a picture where I have plot A, B, and C on the staff report, and I have interior lines that show the setbacks. And I, I didn't put it in for C, but obviously, um, the, the rear lot lines would apply for the back. Uh, and then the side lot lines would apply for the sides. That front area that kind of jags around would be uh, considered a side yard as well. Since it's not along the frontage. So then lot C would, in the very south side of that lot, would be the rear yard, and then it would have two side yards. And then the two side yard would run all the way to Glen Street, or then turn to go to Fort. The rear yard setback would take effect at right where, um, right at this intersection here. So this would be rear yard setback right here. Yeah. And then it would curve over and become side yard setback. Okay. And then 207 there would be another rear yard. And then this would be another rear yard. So it dips around. So it's going to be very odd looking on paper, obviously, but that's how we have to regulate it. And this is side yard because it's not really a front right here. So this is just side. And then it, as we, if we planted, what would the building, would the building options be on C? That don't, wouldn't exist now. So you would be able to build, if, let's say you wanted to build a shed in the backyard and you wanted to put it like right here, you would need to get a variance for that right now. But if you didn't, then you wouldn't have to, like this building right here, if you wanted to rebuild this building or build a new building or whatever, you would have to, this would be the rear lot line. So you would have to, even though you own this these parcels, I would stop to tell you to go back 25 feet or whatever from that lot line. You would not have to come back for a variance if, if you replanted the lots for this. It would make it easier for him to use his property um, with that, without having to come before the board every time he wants to add an addition or a garage or a shed or that or anything. What's involved in doing that? Basically, you uh, hire a surveyor to find the pins and, and, and redraw this as one lot, and then you go to the auditor and reporter and report it. Uh, actually, you come here to the village to get permission to get an application which is a 10 ballot application, by the way, and fill out some paperwork. I say, this conforms to our zoning regulations, then I take it down to the county and report it <coughs> down there, and it becomes an official lot. So I would say, I don't know if exactly, that's not a surveyor, so I don't know what the exact cost would be, but I would say it would be in the hundreds of dollars. And less than 700. Yeah, I vaguely recall it when we were looking at this once before. You talked about the difficulty doing this kind of work in the older part of town for some particular reason. There are, yeah, the sections that run down 
Davis and Whiteman, um, those areas, there was there's some goof in where the right of way of Zing Avenue was, and so they affected the, the property line distances off of that state route all the way down the street. Okay, so that does not apply. That does not apply. Okay. Right. Right. Some of this is the we were just talking about this, the, the combining or, or replotting is hypothetical that the owner expressed, I guess, expressed wishes not to pursue that path. Um, but, um, but continuing on the hypothetical, would it make sense or does this make a difference? Uh, lots A and B seem to be the sort of no-brainer about replotting the one. Um, and even the existing building appears to struggle. But, uh, but is there any reason why they would include it not C unless they needed it for the buildable square footage for the new house? And they wouldn't need it for the square footage of for the lot size for me zoning. Um, I don't know if they would need it for the house itself. Uh, it looks like the most immediate concern would be lot A and B. Um, so you know they could have the option to just replant those two. Uh, my reading of this, uh, or looking at this case, uh, was in the interest of what option would not require variance. And uh, if just replanting both the front lots would not require variance, then I'm okay with that. I don't, I'm not the adamant uh, demand to help to add that rear parcel of lot C in, into it. It could stay separate if they wanted to, but the more immediate concern would be getting A and B done. My question though would be, if, if he purchased the properties in a single deed? I'm not certain about that, I'm not sure. If I think that if we ask him to replant only A and B, we're giving him permission to create an illegal lot by not making him combine all three of those into a lot. Is a lack of ingress and egress? Or is it, do I can't have a lot without front? Mm -hmm. Which well, is what we would, if we, if we're going to make him replant, then we need to consider that as a property in the replant so that that lot is not an illegal lot. Or it's, it, it can't ever be built. You know, if he sold it, he could sell it to the children's center, which would be a great idea. Well, the, 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 possible, well, the, the situation for lot C doesn't change whether or not it's it stays the same or if A and B are replanted. It's but, still but it avo it avoids the need to come back to try and get a variance because of the setback issues as you've already pointed out. I mean it, it, it I, that's points well taken. Your points well taken. Logically, if I own the property, I replant the whole thing just because I would have greater control without having to go to the a, a, a board to say, give me permission to do what I want to do. But I, I think that that's within the John's purview as the zoning administrator to take a look at that. Uh, you know, the practical matter was before us is whether or not the board wants to grant the application. Yeah. Just so anybody, let me, let me get the procedural thing done. If anybody doesn't have any more questions immediately, I'd like to ask the applicant to come forward and make an address. Mm -hmm. The applicant isn't here. I'd like to open a public hearing. Does anybody have anything to say in the public? There's no one here. I'll officially close the public hearing. Back and we already have in the minutes that there, there was service made and, and the applicant was obviously just given the opportunity uh, to uh, present uh, their side of the case and uh, having not been present, they declined to do so. So that brings us back to the board. Now we can, we can do several things with this. We can uh, deny this uh, and put conditions on it, maybe for how he would reapply it, if that would help. Um, we could just deny it outright and let it go. So if I understand this then, if, if, um, if he was to replat this, then it, it, at least as to this, this application and what is he applying for here, it would be moot at that point. Yeah, right. there, would be no, there would be no basis for an application, no cause for an application. That's correct. Okay. Simply a question. That's, that's not 
the state. I'm just trying to understand this. Anything else? Anybody want to put a motion on the table? Do we need to go through the criteria and then and go to the actual vote on the table? See, I do that differently. I put the on the table first and then I go through the criteria, but I'm not quite sure. Okay. I'll, I'll move that we uh, grant the variance. Let's see. Excuse me? So you're moving for, to grant the variance? Yeah, you the variance. Yeah, the you guys to hear that. Well, I can move to the line. Sure. Yeah. I well, I'm the variance. You just want to have a vote. It's not easy. <laughs> okay. I'd second, well, sorry, I don't know if anybody seconded, but I would second it. You second the denial of the variance. Right. Okay. All right. Having said that, we will go through our criteria. Okay. Um, variant standards. Number one, whether the property in question will yield a reasonable return or whether there can be any beneficial use of the property without a variance. Chris? Yes. 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 Whether the variance is substantial. Yes. 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 Um, whether the essential character of the neighborhood would be substantially altered or whether adjoining properties would suffer a substantial detriment as a result of the variance? No. 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 Or whether the variance would adversely affect the delivery of governmental services such as water, sanitary, sewer collection, electrical distribution, stormwater collection, or refuge collection. No. 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 Whether the property owner purchased the property with knowledge of the zoning restriction. Yes. 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 Whether the property the owner's predicament feasibly can be alleviated through some method other than a variance. Yes. 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 Whether the existing conditions from which the variance is being sought were self-created.
Planning Commission to assist in making that interpretation. And, um, I think John is able to go uh, back just sure. right there. It's the building footprint. I mean, some zoning codes do regulate overhangs. Uh, like, for example, in Bellevue, we regulated like bay windows and gutter overhangs. Uh, you know, depend on your closure. If you basically like enclose the deck and the posts actually meet the ground, that's when your that's where your setback is. But if you got something cantilevered, I mean, my familiar with the building code is that you can only cantilever something out for so long. So <laughs> you would have your minimum required yards there anyway. So I stick with the footprint of the building. Uh, I would not encourage anyone to have an overhang that goes over any of anyone else's property. But uh, that's where it would be. So. Yeah, planning commission discussed that. You guys discussed that. Oh. And planning commission, uh, I did talk about it. We talked about that Monday, actually, and um, they were in agreement with that as well. Yeah, I, I gave planning commission VZA minutes from November um, for that meeting because you had asked for some information there, and uh, at that meeting, John told them essentially what he just told you, and they were. Completely in agreement with that interpretation. Good. So we have a bit of a moment here anyway. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second? I'll second. We're adjourned. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You usually want to see it. All in favor say aye. 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 Aye.